Good evening uh, and welcome to the New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. I'm Diane Sayre, the LaRouche candidate for U.S. Senate against Chuck Schumer in the 2022 midterm elections. And today is Friday, July 15th. And uh, we are going to be talking about the implications of the discoveries from the Webb telescope, which has only just begun its operations. And this is really tremendously exciting and comes at a really unbelievably urgent time because somehow we have to lift mankind out of the seemingly intractable crisis where we find ourselves. You have the Russian military action in Ukraine provoked entirely by the British, NATO, and the Biden administration with no end in sight because the Western powers keep sending weapons over there, even though the Ukrainian soldiers uh, are now dying at a rather astounding rate, uh, something like 200 deaths per day um, and six or 800 other casualties. They simply cannot sustain this. Boris Johnson, before he um, was uh, announced his resignation, promised that they would be training 10,000 new Ukrainian soldiers. Well, the UK is training 600. And hopefully, um, most people have not studied Common Core curriculum. And you know that 600 is a far cry from 10,000. So that's not working out so well. And then they're also saying various Brits have written that if you're going to keep arming the Ukrainians, what they're going through in terms of weapons and their various reports, but the Russians, one is that the Russians are destroying about 60% of what we send over there. We don't have an industrial economy. We can't keep up with the demand. And why should we? Uh, so this demonstrates the insanity of the transatlantic world, which has so lost their sense of natural law and principle, universal principles that they are incapable of recognizing that everything they claim they're intending to do is producing the opposite effect. So the sanctions that were announced by Biden being imposed on Russia to supposedly weaken and destroy and isolate Russia instead are weakening and destroying and isolating the United States and Western Europe, the nations that go along with this. Viktor Orban of Hungary said recently that um, he said, well, at the beginning of this, I said we had shot ourselves in the foot, but I'm beginning to think that in the European Union, we've now shot ourselves in the lungs and we're gasping for breath. Uh, governments are falling, like Boris Johnson is out. Mario Draghi is out and he's not coming back. The pro-Nazi raving uh, leader of Estonia is a young woman, I forget what her name is, but at any rate, she is out, probably will come back in some kind of coalition. Uh, we also have the situation in Sri Lanka where mobs were storming the presidential uh, palace and uh, he had to leave. So very unstable. And the question is what could pull mankind together again? Now, one last instance of insanity I can't help but address is this completely psychotic one and a half minute video produced by the Department of Emergency Management in New York City on how to survive a nuclear blast in Manhattan. So it features a young woman standing in front of some brownstones saying, well, it's happened, the big one. What do you do when a nuclear bomb hits. And she said, first thing you should do is get inside. The second thing you should do is stay inside. If you happen to be outdoors when the blast hits, as if you won't have been vaporized, uh, you should immediately get inside, take off all of your clothes because they've been contaminated, wash, put the clothes in a bag somewhere far away, close all your windows and listen to the radio. Now, as one of my colleagues said who called them, this. This might be appropriate instructions for a severe thunderstorm, but a nuclear war, a nuclear war where we now have atomic bombs that are 15 times more powerful than the one we dropped on Hiroshima, where people say that at least 250,000 people would be immediately 
incinerated, where you're talking about a fireball of temperatures greater than the sun, forget it. It's, it's a complete delusion. People are not going to survive. Now, on the other hand, Russia absolutely is not going to drop a nuclear bomb on New York City. They're not hitting population centers in Ukraine. They would have no intention of doing this, no matter how much we provoke them. Uh, they might take out a military, something with military significance. So what what is this? Clearly, it's being designed to drive people mad. The other thing that I find alarming is when you talk to some of these people, you find out that they believe their own wacky narratives. So it's urgent that human beings return to their human as opposed to bestial identity and recognize those qualities which make us unique, that set us above and apart from the animal species, which is namely our creativity our ability to discover new principles or principles that we did not understand before, which allow us to have more power over nature and to create the conditions where more people can live on this planet with a higher standard of living. One of the aspects about the Webb telescope is that there were 20,000 people involved in putting this gigantic machine together and they came from they work together across oceans from many far-flung parts of the planet nonetheless on a shared mission to do something that would allow mankind to achieve great breakthroughs and to get a picture of what ha what was going on in our universe 13.1 billion years ago to the present and uh, as one person said about it it's going to give us not only answer some questions, but it's going to create all kinds of questions that we didn't know that we have. And I think that is perhaps the most optimistic part of this because we're going to discover enormous new potentials about the universe, enormous new discoveries that are urgently needed and will give us a means of shifting the culture and the identity. So tonight I will be joined by three people. Um, first, Joel Dijon, whom people are familiar with, who is also a LaRouche candidate. He is now officially certified on the ballot as the LaRouche independent candidate in Texas in the 38th district. Uh, and then he will be followed by Cal Smith, a professional engineer, longtime associate of Lyndon LaRouche as well, and by David Cherry, who has also uh, worked with LaRouche over many years, uh, engaged in many areas of study. I particularly appreciate the work that he has done, and you see the map in the background on the question of Africa and the urgent mission for Africa to develop and really the potential there once they have over 2 billion people, which is not very long from now, to be one of the leading scientific um, regions of the planet, continents with massive potential, but he has some thoughts also on this breakthrough. So I think I will just stop there and we're going to go to Joel Dijon. Thank you, Diane. On, on another uh, positive note today, uh, July 15th is the, the 47th anniversary of the launch of Apollo Soyuz which in the middle of the Cold War, the US and Russia met in space and they had that famous handshake in space back, like I said, 47 years ago. So that was the lead up to US-Russia collaboration in space that led to the International Space Station. And it would be foolish and foolhardy to give that up. So we have to continue that collaboration. Now on the Webb telescope, it took 25 years from the conception, which was developed out of a deep field survey conducted by the Hubble telescope back in 1995, where they saw smudges of, of what looked like red light, red nebula, and they couldn't break it out. So what they decided to do, and first of all, the Hubble is in space about 350 miles 
of the Earth's surface. And it has a primary mirror of 2.4 meters, about eight feet. And its instruments sense mostly visible light. They have a, a little bit of capability in the infrared, very limited, and the limited capability into the ultraviolet. Now, the Webb Telescope, and the Webb is named after James Webb, who was the NASA administrator during the early and most important parts of the Apollo program. And to this day, he's being attacked by some of the leftists and say that, well, he was a bureaucrat in the State Department back under Truman. He denied some uh, gay lesbians in the government the right to be in the government. But that, that's a totally side issue. Now, the web, to give you a comparison, the primary mirror is six and a half meters about 21 feet in diameter. It's so large that it could not fit into any of the current rockets. It was launched on Christmas Day, last Christmas, on an Ariane 5 rocket, which has a diameter of five meters. So how do you fit a six and a half meter diameter telescope in a five meter rocket? Well, they had to fold it very carefully. And once it reached orbit and it reached its destination, about a million miles from Earth, they had to proceed with a very delicate unfolding of not only the mirror, but a shield to keep the instruments that actually detect the infrared almost to absolute zero. One instrument is about seven Kelvin, which is seven degrees above absolute zero. So that had to be unfolded first, then the primary mirror, then the secondary mirror. But to give you a little bit of the electromagnetic spectrum, and uh, some people might be wondering, why do we need to put these things, these delicate instruments in space. Why don't we just stick them on a mountain, like a mountain of volcano in Hawaii or in the Atacama Desert in Chile? Well, it turns out that the infrared radiation coming from deep space is absorbed by the atmosphere. And the primary component in the atmosphere that absorbs infrared, both coming in and going out, is water vapor not CO2. Now, I happen to have caught a photon. I want to go through a little bit of the relationship between frequency, wavelength, and the speed of light. I happen to have caught a photon in my photon detector, and I've slowed it down to almost zero meters per second velocity, and I've magnified it billions of times. Now, this is a, a simplified model of what the electromagnetic wave looks like. Now, I don't know how clear it's going to appear on the camera, but what you have, the relationship between the speed of light and the wavelength, which is the peak to peak of the wave, and the frequency, which is the number of waves and hit the detector in one second. So if, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible light that we see, it is the main output of our sun and is transmitted through the atmosphere, is in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers, so 400 billionth of a meter, 400 billionth of the meter to 700 billionth of the meter. And the frequency goes into the trillions of cycles per second. So if you look at what we're looking at with the web, it's looking at the infrared range of the spectrum, which is not in nanometers, but in 
eight to 10 microns, that range. So the detectors have to be kept cool because you don't want the thermal energy of the instruments influencing the signal coming in from deep space. So if you look at some of the pictures, I think Cal will have some of the pictures that have been developed by the, the Webb telescope already. You see galaxies which appeared as just smudges in the Hubble telescope. Now, these galaxies go back to the beginning of measurable time over 13 billion years ago. And since Hubble, Edward Hubble showed that the universe was expanding and that it consisted of not just one galaxy, but literally millions and billions. And now we estimate it's two trillion galaxies that some of these galaxies, all you can see, the only light that reaches us is infrared light. And because of the instrumentation of the Hubble, we can not only see the light, which is collected not by that one primary mirror, 21 feet in diameter, but that primary mirror consists of 18 hexagonal segments, which can be moved up laterally and vertically up and down by actuators. So those 18 mirrors come together to form a single image. And these had to be precisely calibrated over the last six months so that one image will make a single image of the detectors of the instrumentation. So this, the largest telescope ever sent into space, it had 344 single points of failure. In other words, at any point in its deployment, if the actuator motor had failed, if they had failed to deploy the space shield to keep the instruments cool, if the secondary mirror had failed to deploy, any of those points of failure would have destroyed the whole mission. The fact that this thing worked perfectly, and as we'll see with the images, is beginning a further exploration of our universe, it is testament to the dedication and the skills and the knowledge of the 20,000 scientists and engineers who worked, some of them their whole career, some of them have worked since the beginning, 25 years on this project. Some of the people working on the project were not even born when it was first conceived. So this is a testament to what mankind can do when they collaborate for a mission and they have the dedicated resources. Now, many points during the last 25 years, the program came close to cancellation, but thank goodness there was perseverance even in some of the politicians. And the results are there now for all to see. And this is an inspiration to the youth who now have something to look forward to besides what they see on their social media or what they see in the news, which is totally depressing. But this has inspired the nation and the world. And I think I'll stop there. and. You can enjoy some of the uh, slides and pictures that will be coming up. Great. Well, thank you so much. Now, Cal has disappeared, but I'm sure he's there somewhere. And uh, we will go now to Cal Smith. There he is. Okay, Cal. You're muted. Cal, we can't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me yeah. now? Okay, yeah, you great. sound a little far away from the microphone, but go ahead. All right. All right, so are you able to see this slide here? Yes, when it's full screen, it'll be better. Yeah, I, I'm ha we're having we trouble go. with it. It's yeah. okay, we got it, go ahead. Okay, good. So this is a, this is a mock-up of the Webb telescope. It's an artist's conception. You can see, 
here in the center, you can see the um, the 18 part mirror that uh, Joel was talking about. And in the mirror here, the light is reflected up to this secondary unit here, which is, and then from there it goes into the different analyzers and filters and whatnot to uh, to, to make the analysis of the of the, uh, of the of the image coming in. And then below it, between the 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 um, the come on, the satellite is parked at that space called L two. There, you should do you see that? Yeah, um, and that is that is a spot where the where it's absolutely stationary, where the gravity of the sun and the Earth cancel out, so that Hubble can be always shielded from the sun by the Earth, and will always go around the sun at the same rate at the same rate that the Earth does. All right, here's an. All right, so here are here is. On the third slide here, you see on this picture here, you'll see the first picture that was released of the Webb telescope. And this area here, and these bright spots, is a group of galaxies that are closer than the ones that were further out. And you can see from, Einstein talk, talked about this, you can see from the effect of the gravity of these galaxies that the images of the uh, galaxies near it, see how they're curved? They're curved by the gravitational effect of the gravitational lensing of the of the of the of, of, the, of these galaxies. Now, Kepler asked, here, here's a question that answer what Joel asked. What is the use? What use is knowledge of things of nature to a hungry belly? What use is the whole of the rest of astronomy? And he says. The reason why the man was joined to the senses by our maker is not only so that man should maintain himself, which many species of living things can do more cleverly with the aid of even an irrational mind, although I'm not sure about some of our political leadership, but also so that those things which we perceive with our eyes to exist, we should strive towards the causes of their being and becoming. And it was, it was Kepler, of course, who came up with the first uh, idea about how the solar system was constructed um, uh, with the elliptical orbits based on uh, the, the golden section relationships and the platonic solids. Now, I'm going to, the reason I'm about to read this is that this tells us one of the challenges presented by the, the Webb telescope, which is that when we're, we're looking back 13 and a half billion years in, in universal history, we're going to see many things that are confounding. And the question of the truthfulness of what we discover was brought up by Einstein, who says that in that what we and this is what we've been that the that that's satisfactory to the pure mathematician to simply have theorems from which he can deduct axioms without errors of logic. He says, but to most people, and this includes many scientists and most of our many engineers and also many Americans, the question as to whether their geometry or their assumptions is true or not doesn't concern a mathematician. But for the purpose of physics, for the purpose of discovering the universe, it's necessary to associate concepts with natural objects. Without such an association, geometry is worthless for the physicists. That is, we want to know if geometry is true. We want to know if our theories or our ideas about the universe are true, or if they're going to be challenged in a fundamental way by what we discover with, with things like the Webb telescope. And if people remember, uh, uh, Lynn LaRouche was a, was, a, was a great advocate of, of not only scientific exploration, but the idea of taking, when he introduced the Strategic Defense Initiative, the idea was was to introduce a whole series of scientific technologies to revolutionize mankind's relationship to nature. And in fact, he said that whatever we say of the fundamental prison principles of astrophysics must be shown to be true for microphysics and living processes as well, and similarly for all combinations of the three. And LaRouche at this point, this was back in 1987, actually had tasked the, the, the organization to become experts, to at least have a, some key understanding of these principles 
and there was application to optical biophysics, that that would be critical to make policy decisions based on a scientific hypothesis that could be reproducible for, 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 uh, for dealing with the kinds of challenges we see now. Um, and then we had Croft Erica, who was a friend of uh, Lynn, and Hel Lynn and Helga LaRouche. In the last two years of his life, he was one on the board of the Schiller Institute. And Croft Erica said that man, the cutting edge of terrestrial life, has no rational alternative but to expand the environmental and resource base beyond Earth. Global development must be based on an open world concept and include both the development of extraterrestrial resources and the wiser management of our terrestrial resources. This is the extraterrestrial imperative. Its central goal is the preservation of civilization. So why do I bring this up? Well, many people have heard of the Big Bang Theory and the Big Bang Theory argues that for some reason, 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was created. Uh, and then a second later, we began to have the formation of stars and galaxies. And they don't really talk much, uh, the, the people that developed this theory don't talk much about why those things occurred, but their hope, but, and, and already some have come forward and said that the James Webb Telescope, because it can look back 13.5 billion years ago, you've already heard pronouncements that, it, that the James Webb Telescope proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Big Bang Theory is correct. However, the problem with the Big Bang Theory is that if you follow it to its logical conclusion, you get to Norbert Wiener. And Norbert Wiener's idea, he was the, he was the, the father of artificial intelligence, which if you read our press today, we're told that artificial intelligence will replace mankind's thinking processes. Well, here's the words himself of the man who developed this, is that as the universe spreads out, which uh, that, that it tends to, the universe is going to tend to lose energy and run down. And that, as he says, in a very real sense, we are shipwrecked passengers on a doomed planet. Yet even in a shipwreck, human decencies and human values are not necessarily banished, and we must make the most of them. We shall go down but let it be in a matter to which we may look forward as worthy of our dignity. In other words, this kind of pessimism that saturated the ruling circles of, of the West argues that something like the Webb Telescope, well, you know, maybe some specialists be able to learn something out of it. But really, the only reason you do something like this is for a form of entertainment or titillation. Now, most people don't believe that. You look again at this, at this picture. You can see that that the screen of that picture is the, is the same size as if you had taken a grain of sand and held it between your two fingers an arm length away from your eye. That that's how big the field of view is of the of the of the web telescope. That's how much it magnified that field of view. And you can see the more you look at it's actually interesting to let this picture sink in because the more you look at it, the more you see galaxies. The red ones are, 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 are supposed are, are moving away from us more rapidly than the, than the ones that are more white. You see the curvature caused by the gravity uh, uh, effect of those, of those very bright galaxies that are closer to us in the front. And you begin to get an idea of the actual coherence when you look at this between the human mind and the universe. It's not. If, if the universe were running down, if the universe were running down the way that Norbert Wiener and these people said, then how come, how come it, the further out you go, the more galaxies you get, the more creation you get, the more, the, the more that the cosmic dust and the other undifferentiated materials in space form these structures that are very well ordered, that are very intricate. So clearly we're gonna learn we have the potential to learn and challenge some very basic ideas and theories that we've held looking at the James telescope, the James Webb telescope, and that the same understanding can be applied 
because of the nature of man's mind, because of the nature of things in the very large and things in the very small, that these lessons will be applied to solving many, many problems on the earth. So I want to go through something here very briefly, which although it's, it's not to give you an idea of how the spectral the spectra that Joel was talking about is that every every um, compound in the universe absorbs light in different frequencies. So you know sodium, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, for example, um, they all absorb and emit light at different frequencies. And so one of the things the Hubble Space Telescope can and uh, so for example, if you look at the Earth's atmosphere, you'll see different out and different compounds that absorb light in different places. You see water uh, absorbs light at a, certain, at a certain frequency. You see carbon dioxide does. You see oxygen does at different places and water does, right? Well, if you compare this, trans, this spectrum with the Earth's atmosphere, one of the things that the, uh, one of the photos that the Webb telescope uh, issued, although I haven't been able to find the un, uh, the undoctored one like this was a tele was of a planet um, 1,100 light years away called WASP 96b. And what the what the James Webb Telescope can do is when the planet or an exoplanet comes in front of its sun, the sunlight shines through the atmosphere, and the Webb Telescope can take a spectral analysis of the light that comes through the atmosphere and determine what compounds are in that atmosphere. So in WASP-96b, which is one of 5,000 confirmed planets around other stars in the Milky Way, what they found was that the atmosphere has, has absorption, show, has spectra of water vapor in it. So this indicates that, and with more work, they can find other compounds in it. And Webb is also able to tell them precisely how big these planets are. Uh, so in this particular case, looks like we have a planet that is has has water vapor on it at least. It's it's um, it's it's a it's half the size of ja it, it's one point. It's a little bit bigger than Jupiter, but about half the mass. But what's interesting is they've been able to determine what is in the the atmosphere of this planet. Now, this tells you knowing this tells you how the other other solar systems are generated and it can also tell you at a certain point that if you turn this same kind of technology on uh, uh, planets uh, or moons in our own atmosphere, you'd be able to learn more about them as well. So it tells you uh, about the processes that may build atmospheres. Um, so here, for example, is another picture. This was a picture taken by Webb of something called the, it, it, it's an area called NGC 3324, which is, a, that's just a fancy name for a region of space uh, called the Carina Nebula. And what you see in this picture, the clouds are actually matter that's being um, expanded and superheated by stars that are being formed and by intense radiation within this area. So, and, and what's, what's happening within this, within this cloud is that new stars are being formed and moving away from the cloud. So again, if the universe is winding down, if, if as the universe expands, everything is supposed to stop moving and, and wind down into nothing, how can it be that here 7,600 light years away, we have an, a, 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 a part of space that's producing new stars? And then I just wanted to go back because the question raises, we know the existing financial system is coming to an end. There, there, there are other countries now are beginning to trade in other currencies. The, the, the US uh, proxy war against the Russians is failing. The European economies because of the sanctions and because of the war against Russia are failing. So there's going to be a new system. Now, well, that system, if, if, if we do our work, if we can organize people, if we can run effective campaigns, if we can begin to talk about these ideas, can we make the system based on the true nature of mankind? 
which is scientific mastery of the laws of the universe and application to solving really pro real problems and becoming a space faring nation? Or do we let the failed policies continue to fail and take a stand with them? And that's what I wanted to say. Great. Thanks so much. All of this is material for about five long conferences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <as> five. <laughs> I apologize to all of our viewers because I know everything we're looking at, you would like to ponder over for hours. So I'm going to yeah. go ahead and introduce uh, David Cherry, who will give us some more things to ponder. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, second, we have the title slide. Well, maybe not. I'll, I'll move along. Um, I, I called my talk, um, just a minute here, uh, The Principle of Continuing Creation. The Principle of Continuing Creation, in parentheses, anti-entropy, colon, the necessary basis for progress in science and culture. And the subtitle is The Astrophysics of Victor Hambartumian. Victor Hambartumian. <clears throat> if an enthusiastic layman inspired by the accomplishments of the Hubble Space Telescope and now the Webb Telescope wishes to make his or her own investigation of the cosmos, where should he begin? The serious layman must confront the fact that the fields of astrophysics and cosmology have their own dogmas, which obscure certain anomalies and contradictions that should be the stepping stones to scientific advances, just as they were for Johannes Kepler in the 17th century. <clears throat> but ex acceptance of these dogmas is today obligatory for obtaining any standing in the field. <clears throat> Since the 1930s, the overarching paradigm has been the Big Bang Theory of the universe. It is not coincidental that this theory is in good alignment with the Malthusian ideology prevailing in much of the world. Now, you can see that Cal Smith did me the honor of introducing my talk. <laughs> Thank you, Cal. Uh, according to the Big Bang Theory, the universe originated in, a, in the explosion of a singularity and has been expanding entropically ever since. The major processes in the universe are understood to be gravitational collision, accretion, and collapse. In recent decades, the, the debate has been A, whether the universe will continue to expand indefinitely with potential energy dissipating in the process. This is called heat death because there will eventually be no heat differential anywhere. That's worse than the Great Green Reset. Or B, whether, whether the expansion of the universe will eventually become weaker than the countervailing gravity of the system of the universe, leading to a, a reversal of the process, a, a gravitational collapse. In, a, in other words, death in the so-called big crunch. <clears throat> Face the facts, they tell you. Whether it is A or B, the human species is but a speck in a, in a meaningless, and temporary universe. <clears throat> but this is where Victor Humbert Sumian comes in. Amazingly, this brilliant astrophysicist in the Soviet Union, working from the 1920s to the end of the 1980s, developed major new conceptions in astrophysics from an anti entropic standpoint, even though he did not use the expression anti entropy. Hamar Sumian, 1908 to 1996, in Soviet Armenia, was considered the founder of theoretical astrophysics in the USSR. Uh, in 1994, he was officially named a national hero of, of Armenia. Um, we could have slides here if that's possible. Um, yes, we, th yeah, there you are. Yeah. There's, uh, there's, there's that's a picture that was sent me by one of uh, Humbert Sumian students. Uh, and then the next picture, please, slide three. Uh, and then uh, slide four, I think. 
that there is a Hamrat Sumian, the, the national hero of Armenia on the, the, the hundred, uh, what's their currency, the hundred dram note. Despite the Iron Curtain, he was always allowed to travel abroad. He addressed meetings of the International Astrophysical Union in San Francisco and elsewhere, and read papers to at least two of the Solvay conferences in Brussels. <clears throat> he was also the first Soviet scientist to become a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, 1958, and, and foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. National Academy, 1959. But in the international arena, the praise was almost always limited to his observational accomplishments. Certainly, his underlying conception of an anti-entropic universe was not welcome. The seemingly comprehensive work, a book called Active Galactic Nuclei by Julian Carlick of Johns Hopkins University, published 1999, has no entry for Humbert Sumian in the bibliography or the index, despite Humbert Sumian's groundbreaking work in this field. He built the Biarritz Astrophysical Observatory near Yerevan, the Armenian capital, in the 1950s, and developed his school of thought among his students. He died in 1996. <clears throat> uh, here are just some, uh, we'll go to slide, slide five, please, Jose. Here are just some of Humbert Sumian's theses, always developed from careful analysis of, of, of his own and others' work at the telescope. But be aware that these morsels are not self-explanatory, but only indicative. You must read Humbert Sumian's papers. First, the idea of the creation of something that did not exist prior to a certain time. The creation of something that did not exist prior to a certain time shows up often in Humbert Sumian's later papers on the formation and evolution of objects in space. This refers especially to the creation of particles with non-zero rest masses. Uh, we're not talking about photons here. Uh, but Professor Harus Union finds this tendency uh, in Humbert Sumian's work from the beginning in the late 1920s. Slide six, please. Another principle. Energy is being produced in our epoch within any finite volume of space such as a, as a galaxy, Humbert Sumian, Sumian proved that, quote, in our epoch, stars of all ages can be found within a finite volume of space, unquote. Next, next on that same slide, systems of multiple galaxies may not be in the process of collapse and collision as they are said to be. Instead, the component galaxies may have been a single object which then broke, broke off and spread apart. Slide seven, the energy emitted by active galactic nuclei, AGNs, is from energy contained in the nucleus and not from the gravitational collapse of diffuse matter. An AGN is a compact body at the center of a galaxy that is highly energetic, usually in radio and x-rays, but also in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. It may eject matter at relativistic velocity Velocities. Slide eight, please. Um, what is that slide? Yes, there you see Cygnus A, a tiny dot in the middle. Uh, yeah, very tiny, scarcely visible dot in the middle but between the two lobes is the galaxy. And inside it, there is an active galactic nucleus. And it is so energetic that it is spewing out these large bodies of gas, largely hydrogen. Um, uh, and the, the image shows different colors, meaning uh, what you can see at different radio wavelengths. Um, so it's not all about collapse. <laughs> Slide nine. Uh, quasars may have been ejected by AGNs. A process may exist in which an energetic physical object may eject another object that did not exist within the original object before ejection. Maybe you recall, some of you, that Lyndon LaRouche talked about this with respect to the atomic nucleus 
He said, just because a nucleus emits an, an electron does not mean the electron was in there beforehand. The electron was, its, it's character was, was determined in the process of ejection, emission. So here, Humbert Tumian is stating the same principle on the galactic scale. Some of his students have remained committed to his concepts that reflect an anti-entropic universe. Among these, Professor Hike Harut Union is prominent. Some other students have shed his view. Perhaps they felt the burden of international ostracism was too great. Uh, but there, there was still one more chapter. An unconventional and audacious but influential theoretical astrophysicist in the United States. Richard Nelson Thomas had set out in the early 1990s to, quote, redo Eddington, unquote. And Humber and Sumian came into his field of view. The re reference to Eddington is to Sir, Sir Arthur Eddington, who died in 1944, and who had been, as it were, the final word on stellar thermodynamics, and was still so, um, into the 80s and beyond. Thomas, who had been a co-founder of the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics in Boulder, Colorado, thought that Humbert Sumian's ideas about the appearance of new mass in stars were a real possibility. Some stars, Th Thomas thought, also seemed to lose mass too rapidly to be consistent with their apparent ages. The possible creation of new mass was to be a focus of this new phase of Thomas's work. He was planning a new, new international center, Armenia and the United States and Mexico for his work and held an initial seminar in Washington toward this end. But he suffered a, suffered a debilitating stroke in 1992. He worked on, on the idea fitfully the, thereafter until his death in 1996. He had become my friend and told me he wanted Humbert Sumian to be the chairman of the board with Halton Arf, the American at the Max Planck Institute, Cornelis de Jager, Utrecht University, and himself as members of the board. But his idea did not go forward without him. Today, none of those figures apart from Professor Harut Union is still with us. But there are others in Armenia, as I mentioned. It is now in your hands. It is in your hands to understand and propagate Humbert Sumian's ideas in the English speaking world and beyond to help the world escape the Malthusian trap constrain, constraining science and culture. If Humbert Sumian's work is too difficult for you, you must at least identify the impossibility of the reigning paradigm and point to Humbert Sumian as working toward a scientifically grounded paradigm that recognizes that power can grow in the universe that power can grow in the universe, and by extension, the power of life and of intelligent life. But what do you have to work with if you don't read or speak Russian? First and foremost, there's the possibility of contact with astronomers and astrophysicists at the Burakhan Astrophysical Observatory in Armenia. In late 2014, Ben Dennison, Megan Roulard, now Ogden, and I visit, visited retired astronomer Nora Andreasi and Thomas in Boston. She had been one of Humbert Sumian's students. Nora introduced us to Professor Haro Tunian by way of a Skype call to Armenia. He was, he was at that time the director of the Bjorkan Astrophysical Observatory. Unfortunately, we did not then or later have any work underway along Humbert Sumian's lines for which we could invoke his help. My own writing in the field of astrophysics was principally in the 1990s. But today, I'm talking about today, July 15th, I reached out to Professor Harold Tunian, and like a rose ever blooming, he responded within a few hours. He, he is open to a collaboration if someone here wants to do some hard work to study and write about Humbert Sumian's work. Slide 10, please. Uh, there are some books that will help. There's a little biography of Humbert Sumian. It's a popular biography, but it's it's got a lot of meat in it. It's published in 1987. Um, uh, it, and it touches on many of his discoveries and hypotheses. Uh, although it's out of print, you can 
find a copy at book, bookfinder.com. And slide 11, A Life in Astrophysics. These are selected papers of Humbert Sumian, edited by his son. But uh, the father, Victor, selected the papers himself with, with an eye to the ones which he thought, especially pointing the way forward. See especially the last papers in this book. And slide 12, another book called Humbert Sumian's Legacy and Active Universe, edited by uh, Professor Harwood Union and others. This, this is a, these are papers by others about his work and, and in papers extending his work. A key paper in, in this collection is one by Harwood Union himself called Humbert Sumian's Paradigm for the Activity of galactic nuclei and the evolution of galaxies. I drew upon this paper in assembling the partial list of Humbert Sumian's ideas above. A few final words about Humbert Sumian's optimism of outlook. When the poet Aramis Sakyan had a long conversation with him, uh, Sakyan asked him, and this is reported in uh, in the little biography. He asked him, are we alone in, in the universe? His answer, I am certain that we are not. The universe is a vast organism, and it is naive to think that life, life exists only on that infinitesimally small part of it called the Earth. Sakin asked, what is man in the universe? He answered, man himself is a micro universe within the universe. This is both poetic and scientifically accurate. I, I think Nicholas of Cusa would agree. Leibniz would agree. <laughs> um, when asked, what is the meaning of life? Humbert Sumian responded, to be useful throughout one's ideas and one's activity. Those people are unfortunate who are incapable of doing good, who think only of their personal advantage. The life of such people lacks the great purpose contained in the meaning of the word life. Sakin asked, do you have any opponents? Of course, he knew the answer to that. Humbert Sumian answered, many. When a new idea is born, it has at first only one supporter, its author. When the theory on the activity of galactic nuclei was formulated at Bayuricon, many scientists around the world rejected it. Recognition came later. In short, he who has no opponents in science has no individuality. What do you think about love, Sakyan asked. How much Sumian answered, human warmth, human warmth is as necessary to us as the vital warmth radiated by the sun. I repeat that. Human warmth is as necessary to us as the vital warmth radiated by the sun. Unfortunately, however, people are increasingly unwilling to share the warmth of their hearts. And when hearts grow cold, wars begin. And speaking of sharing, on another occasion, Humbert Sumian observed that what you share remains your own, but what you withhold is simply lost. So get to work if you can. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Actually, these things, all of this, um, if you stop to reflect on all the things we take for granted, like the question of matter suddenly originating somewhere or, or not being actually created, um, and it really also makes me think of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, now we see as through a glass darkly. <laughs> uh, our understanding is so limited, but this is why it's so important. And I was reflecting as I was writing the email for this meeting that what is the premise of the environmentalist movement and the Malthusian view really, which is not only um, that things are winding down, but it's a real kind of arrogance that somehow here we are in the year 2022 13.1 billion years after the images that were shown there. And we human beings have not been around here for very much time in that um, span of time. 
but we have pompously decided that we know everything there is to know about the universe. There's nothing else to be discovered. Uh, there's no possibility of increasing resources and children might as well now turn to things like wondering what gender they are or something very small as opposed to realizing that there is so much to learn. Every single human being on the planet, nearly 8 billion people, actually could make a discovery of something new that no one else understood before. And we still wouldn't know everything going on in the universe. And I just think that's incredibly optimistic. Um, so I know I scared everyone by saying how little time we have, but I'll just open it up uh, for any of you who have thoughts on what's what's been presented. We have a few minutes. Yeah, I'd like to uh, uh, comment on what you had said and also what the other speakers had said. Was that, and, and going back to the question of uh, LaRouche and, and Croft Erica, which is, and Croft Erica, one of the funniest things he ever said was, I thought, was that the true environmentalist is, is, is a space, is someone who believes in the development of space. He says, and the reason is, and, and LaRouche talked about this too, he said that what LaRouche had said is that if you maintain any economy at a fixed level of technological and scientific progress, that you will run out of resources at that level of technology, right? So, um, but on the other hand, because each child, each human being is capable of making creative discoveries you're able to change your willfully mankind can change its technological base and discover new resources that didn't that weren't resources before the beauty of something like the hubble the web telescope is it shows us it, it challenges every <laughs> it has the potential to challenge every axiomatic assumption in science and economics and it really puts the environmentalists on the hot seat because if we're only a tiny, tiny piece of the universe and our mind can conceive of, of going back 13 and a half billion years, then really what we need to do is to have many, many, many more people at higher standards of living, consuming more resources at higher technological levels, which will discover through the development of the space program and, and learning how to apply as we as we develop the cosmos and move into outer space starting with the moon and moving on to mars will actually make earth more of a garden <laughs> yeah so. that's right joel I, I was thinking of the people who complained about the 10 billion dollars that we spent on uh, building uh, designing deploying the web after reading that the U.S. defense budget just went up to $840 billion just in one year, and the Congress, mostly Democrats, voted to increase Biden's request from $802 billion to $840 billion. So we have, we have plenty of money to spend on weapons, but the fact that we can build and deploy such an instrument as the web in collaboration with scientists all over the world means that there is hope and if you listen to some of the interviews of some of the the scientists and engineers who worked on this who look at the pictures who knew what they were expecting but are surprised and you can see in their voices the one comment is that the universe is beautiful. It's <laughs> poetic and it's not entropic. Yeah, and not only the eight hundred and forty-nine billion dollar defense budget, but the ten trillion dollars that uh, uh, a certain Chuck Schumer and some other people uh, wanted to spend in the last two years to bail out rotten Wall Street and British banks. So. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> so well, clearly, so what, what is the value of money 
in space anyway. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely meaningless. It's a question of, of credit. It's a question of what you do with it. Um, I think it's so <laughs> exciting, uh, David, that you reached this professor and um, that, I mean, I had no idea that Armenia had this incredible legacy of scientists. Um, and one makes you reflect on what a horrible thing a nuclear war would be, because that would be the end of all of this. But uh, <laughs> also, I think we somehow we should take you up on his take him up on his offer to do some work. This is so rare. I can only agree. Oh, by the way, speaking about Armenian heritage, Humbert Sumiel's father, um, well, he may have been a lawyer, uh, but what his real love was his translating of Homer into Armenian. <laughs> yeah. There's well, another really angle to Armenian history, culture. But yes, we, we need to um, we need to find, figure out how to take, take him up on his offer. I think so. <laughs> yes, I think so as well. Uh, just, you know, we have very interesting comments on Facebook from people in many different parts of the world. Uh, people saying that, uh, how can we get other people to understand this? Uh, and what does this mean? How do we explain it to people? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. No, it's, it's really wonderful. And then we also have some comments from people asking, what about the power grid? Uh, I guess since Joel is in Houston, um, people are thinking about that. But I think it's happening anywhere. But don't you see the absurdity of it? Shortages of water, shortages of energy. And some of these problems we've already solved, I think people don't bother to take time to think about where water comes from on the International Space Station, for example. It's not like lots of new water is being brought up there, so <laughs> use your imagination. <laughs> you know, the question of how we get people to understand this is not a bad question. In fact, it's a very important question. And I think, look, as Diane, as, as Diane pointed out, and she knows on the street, and, and, and Americans right now are facing a real problem. Is they can't afford energy, they can't afford food, or many people are, are losing the ability to pay their rent or pay food. Um, we're, we're, we're hyperinflating the, as the dollar, in fact, is becoming, which worked for many, many years as a reserve currency globally because the U.S. dollar represented a commitment by the government for scientific and technological progress and production. That commitment's not there in U.S. policy, right? At least not in the, in the people you see, the Blinkens, the Bidens, right? The, the, the people who are running policy. So the question is, you're going to have to, you, you, the question is, is just to get out, you know, join it, join the, Join Diane's campaign. Get out and, and, and talk to people about the, the, the connection between between scientific progress and, and, and the kinds of economic and scientific and cultural policies which share those scientific ideas and that scientific optimism. Get involved in the classical and the classical cultural work that we're doing. Um, those are good questions. And this is, you know, this is, What's coming out of the web, teles uh, web telescope is going to continue to confound and provoke people uh, in, in all kinds of ways. And it, it's a good time to, to actually talk to people. Don't make this a, an entertainment venture. Um, these are real ideas that affect real people in real time. Um, that's, uh, I mean, this, this is a good question to want to know how to communicate that. Well, uh, one way is musically, I was thinking of the six plus months it took to fine tune this 
Webb telescope. It's all like a, a symphony tuning before a performance of a great symphony. And the universe is the greatest composition. And the fact that man can understand, at least begin to understand that composition and recreate it in his culture through music is proof that we are the, the purpose of creation because we can understand it. That's right. Well, I think we have to wrap up this evening, but clearly there's a lot to be discussed and maybe there should be other um, symposia or just other discussions on this work as it unfolds. I'm sure there's going to be many aspects. Let me just say uh, coming up next Friday, I will be joined by uh, EIR economics editor Paul Gallagher and William Schmidt, who is the a libertarian candidate for state controller in New York. We're going to be discussing some things about the Federal Reserve and the need for a national bank. Uh, how do you get an economy that allows such things as this breakthrough? And then uh, the following week on the 29th, Megan DeBroat will be joining me and perhaps others to discuss astrobiology because this breakthrough with the Webb telescope caused her to think of the implications for life, the question of life, uh, the origin of life, another great mystery. Um, and I think that will be also very exciting. Let me finally say that uh, everyone watching, I should put in the chat here uh, underneath on Facebook and YouTube, the link to the Schiller Institute petition for a new Bretton Woods, because I think we're really on the cusp. You know, Boris Johnson is out, Draghi is out. I mentioned these things at the beginning. We're at a moment of a revolutionary phase change and policies that people associated with LaRouche, like all of us here, have been fighting for for decades, which were nearly impossible to implement when people had the misperception that the current system was sound or was still functioning in some way. One thing we can thank uh, Boris Johnson, Joe Biden and others for is that nobody has the perception that the system is working anymore. That's a good thing. So it creates an opportunity where everything can be changed and we can establish an entirely new paradigm which really is the fight. So I'd urge everyone, add your name to the Schiller Institute petition to convene, to create a committee for a new Bretton Woods. So with that, I want to thank all of you, uh, Joel Dijon, Cal Smith, David Cherry, for joining me tonight. And I think we'll all hear more from all of you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. <laughs>